You know, you're so nice and made me tea. I think I have to be nice to you today. You you have to be nice. You were very sassy yesterday. Yesterday, Brittany, mm-hmm. we traveled to North Carolina and uh, was doing the very important abandoned building art project yes. that we've started. Mm-hmm. So there was a little bit of sass. But yeah. you know, today, mm-hmm. I guess there can be less sass. Plus sass. Yeah. One thing though, Brittany, mm-hmm. if we're starting out. Right. Are you ready to record? I'm ready to record. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, I would like to give a shout out to to one of our listeners rose who who hosted me the past weekend mm-hmm. and it was quite marvelous of them to do that in fact there might be a special episode mm-hmm. involving rose when she comes down to visit us oh really what yes. topic peppers it'll be about peppers peppers and capsaicin yes. peppers mm-hmm. in the the capsaps oh nice yes, very nice yes mm-hmm. the burning the burning twinge I wonder if she would appreciate the song Spicy Taco. She probably would, yeah. Oh, It's about good. capsaicin. So. It is about capsaicin. Yes, the burn but on the tongue. you know what really burns my gears? What? You know what? You know what I have a burn for? You know what passion burns in me? What passion burns in you? Making and developing proteins what? in my body that oh. work well. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yep, you're, you're just like, every day, you're just like, oh, day. God, yes, I'm making proteins. This is so great. Every day. Whenever mm-hmm. I go and do curls in the squat rack, I'm like, uh-huh. man, today's the day. All those proteins are getting built. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it's the a, only appropriate way. That's, that's your form. passion in life. Your your number one goal is to building up those proteins. Okay. The, building up the proteins. I totally believe that. You know what else I like doing? What's Brittany? that? What's that? Folding. Up? Folding in appropriate places. Folding? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, this is mm-hmm. a this is a really <laughs> long segue. I don't know about this one. It's not a segue. Yeah. We can we can start over. Or we can keep going. <laughs> we, it really doesn't matter. Let's just keep going. When you combine two of my favorite things, Brittany, uh-huh. proteins Pro- and folding proteins and folding what do you get you get prions no you don't because i folded the right way oh you, you fold it the right prions, way you don't fold the right way oh okay like imagine you're doing yoga Brittany. okay and you just fold the wrong way and the rest of your body collapses with you like right. you, like you you start folding from the top of your head onto the ground and then the whole mm-hmm. body just follows yeah this sounds like when Poor you broke form. my neck in seven places in martial arts it was a part of training <laughs> You were learning yeah. a lesson. Uh, was I? Yeah. About about letting show other people how to do a judo throw using my body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. It's all right. Anyway, prions. Let's talk about prions today. Yay, prions. Yeah. All right, Brittany. So, we have prions, right? Mm-hmm. That doesn't sound too scary. Like, oh. when I think of scary, I think of, say, like, the Ebola virus, or also known as the bloody mask virus. Right. Uh, no, the, the Ebola virus, while it can be dangerous in third world countries, it's not really something that's a threat, and it's something that can be treated. Whereas a prion, it's essentially an unstoppable killing machine. It's responsible for such epidemics as mad cow disease back in the 1990s, a lot of people remember, in the UK. And there's essentially no stopping them. So prions are a very, very scary thing. Much scarier than any virus that we've really talked about, other than perhaps the rabies virus, which will... I mean, you know how many people have died from influenza? A lot. Yeah. But you can treat it. Probably more than yellow... Wait, prions. Probably more than prion deaths. Yeah, probably more than prion deaths. Prion deaths are very, very rare. However, once you have... So it's more of like a nightmare rather than... Uh, epidemic problem. Yes, exactly. It's uh, not very common to get a prion. And we're going to get into the different types of prions, how they actually spread, and what you uh, can expect if you get a prion. Listen, you said that there's no cure, but Mm -hmm. in my eyes, whenever I've read about prions, there's an easy medication for this, Brittany. Especially if you have humans and you want to avoid humans infecting other humans, much like say, the zombie virus or other things like that, mm-hmm. such as rabies. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. What, what's that? It's a nice 22-metal pill. <laughs> Straight to the temple? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. That would stop it. I'm yep. just saying, when you think of prions, at least what I think of is like 28 days or weeks later. They're, they're, where Both of those are a new thing. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Instead of just running around in circles about this prion, what is a prion, Brittany? Okay. So a prion... 
as defined, is a misfolded protein that can cause normal proteins in the brain to misfold as well. So their name derives from the term proteinaceous infectious particle. And unlike other infectious agents like viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungi, prions are always progressive, they have no known cures, and they're always fatal. So they're unstoppable killing machines. So once you have them, there's no going back. There's it's, no going back. There's You're... only death. straight to death. Straight to death, yes. So it really is like a nightmare infection, so to speak. Yes. And that it won't necessarily wipe out mankind, but mm -hmm. there's no stopping it once you have it. Exactly. And it sounds like it aggregates, right? It does. So you have a prion, mm -hmm. and then it's like, oh, yeah, I'm not a part of your system, man. <laughs> and then he goes over to the little playground, and he's like, oh, you proteins, are you with me? <laughs> yeah, we're all going to rebel. And they're all like, what? And then he goes over, and he's like, yeah. And then he hands them a little bit of the, uh, the prion. Dust. Propaganda. Yeah. And then they read the literature and they're like, uh, oh, yeah, man, we're not a part of your system either. Yeah. So it converts them. And then you have an entire army of prions mm -hmm. taking over. Yes. And exactly. there's no stopping them. Exactly. That's why it's progressive because it'll start with one misfolded protein and it'll spread to others. And each of those misfolded proteins can infect other proteins. So it's a pretty quick death once it starts to spread further. Wow. So yeah. it's like a virus, but from your own makings. Yes. It's like you had mm -hmm. a child and it rebels against you. And then it raises up its own kingdom, and then it battles you in a bloody civil war, and then you eventually lose falling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one way to think about how they spread. We can get into the actual science of how they spread, too, though. Okay, let's get into the actual science, right? All right, let's do it. So there is a major prion protein, PRP, and that actually occurs in the nervous system of mammals. And its function is mostly unknown, but scientists have proposed that PRP plays a role in cell signaling or synapse formation. So something known as a prion protein is different from the prion disease that you might hear characterized. There's something known as PRPC, which is the normally folded conformation of PRP, but then there's an alternatively folded PRP known as PRPSC, and that's the one that tends to aggregate in the brain to, due to its more compact conformation. And it's also protease resistant. So protease is an enzyme that catalyzes proteolysis or the breakdown of proteins into smaller polypeptides or single amino acids. So PRP, protein, mm -hmm. thought to be for cell signaling or the formation of synapses. So synapses are just the little ends of the little neurons that allow for them to connect. So you have the dendrites, which are like the little itty bitty tree branches. And then you have the synapses right next to that, which catch it. And that allows for the little jump. Mm -hmm. in between each nerve, right? Right. So if you start having these proteins that are supposed to help signal the body what to do start rebelling against you, it starts yeah. collecting all the messages and the communications in between each of the nerves, right? Just like a centralized mm -hmm. government starts <laughs> sending it away, mm -hmm. yep. changing it, mm -hmm. putting in its own propaganda. Yes, exactly. Whispering in your ear. <laughs> are you feeling like uh, rebellious today? There's a lot of anarchic uh, manifestos. I'm just saying, if I was a prion, I'm pretty sure if you listen close enough, each prion is screaming on their soapbox <laughs> about the anarchy and taking down Big Brother. Yeah, okay? probably, yes. So my point is that prions constantly are trying to overthrow the status quo, mm -hmm. the system, the homeostasis. Yeah, they right? absolutely are. And they're so good at it that they're able to avoid being broken down. So your your protease, which is the enzyme that break down the proteins, it's like, no, you can't fit me. I'm not a part of your system, man. <laughs> and it just continues to rebel. Yeah. And exactly. that way it can continue to spread its propaganda. Yeah. And it can spread its propaganda both horizontally and vertically. So a horizontal transmission occurs when an infectious agent spreads among members of the same species that are not related. So think of spreading a virus amongst a group of people. Think of like a sickness going around a kindergarten and then that'll spread to the parents and then that'll spread at their workplace, etc. So that's an example of horizontal transmission. There's also a vertical transmission and that occurs through familial lines. So think parent to child. So there's two different ways that uh, prion diseases can spread. Horizontal and vertical transmission, just like economical, horizontal, and vertical integration, right? Mm -hmm. Now, my question here, Brittany, is if you have it go from one species to another, is that still horizontal transmission? Because technically that's in between the same species. It is between, uh, in between the same species. So something that goes from one species to another is usually categorized as something else. And we'll actually get a bit more into that when we talk about the different types of prion 
uh, transmissions because that is one of the major ones that is well known is mad cow disease that originally came from cows and then spread to humans. Often when I read about infectious diseases as far as microbes go in between species, I typically hear that it's called a crossover. Oh, a crossover. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so you have horizontal transmission and vertical transmission, right? Mm -hmm. And so it can either spread amongst a little group of people or through families, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, Brittany. So you said that the most popular, the most like exciting one, like the most famous one is PRPSC, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Then, wait, <laughs> I didn't think that through. Why are, why are you half naked now? <laughs> It's it's just, really it's I, really sweaty. I just this. look over and and you're naked. <laughs> That's my life ninety percent of the time. Yeah. You, you know how many rivers I've ended up in naked, yeah, naked, and yeah. I didn't mean to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. an, no, an alarming not. amount of rivers have oh. had my naked body. Listen, yeah. our listeners don't need to listen <laughs> to this conversation. I'm deleting this entire conversation. <laughs> I don't need them to know that I end up naked in rivers. They'll uh -huh. never respect us anymore. They, they already know. That was like <laughs> half of the second episode was your stories about being naked in rivers. The point is, Brittany, <laughs> is that if the PRP protein occurs where you have the formation of synapses, which is in the central nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. Then how does it actually create those misfold? How does it transmit its anarchistic ways to other proteins? Well, the exact molecular mechanisms that cause the transmissible transmissible misfolding to occur are still unknown. However, the misfolding can lead to an accumulation of amyloid fibers, which these are clumps of proteins in the central nervous system that lead to brain damage and eventually death. So whereas scientists aren't entirely sure how this happens, they know that the misfolding causes these big globules of proteins to clump together in the brain, causing these fibrils, which in turn leads to brain damage. So the amyl fibers, which are clumps of proteins folded together so that it can make other proteins of itself, right? Mm -hmm. Once the prion gets a hold of that, right? That's like a radio station broadcasting further out, <laughs> being able to produce more and more pumping out little puppies of children entire male litters of just <laughs> anarchist being produced right well, yes essentially that starts to accumulate and cause brain damage mm -hmm. and other neurodegenerate activities so these are diseases are actually known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies or tses which refer to the sponge-like holes that appear in the brain as a result of the brain damage i'm pretty sure my brain is already a sponge-like hole Oh, yeah? It's just a sponge because you soak up so much information. No, grad school has taught me <laughs> that yeah. if I'm dumb enough to stay in this program, uh -huh. then I have nothing but holes in my brain. Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, Brittany, uh -huh. we've talked about prions, which are just misfolded proteins that will aggregate other misfolded proteins. Mm -hmm. Let's look at some of them more specifically. What are some specific prions? Mm-hmm. That we can highlight. Okay, so we can look at specific prion diseases, the most well-known and well-studied of which is known as creutzfeldt jacobs disease, or CJD. So it's an incredibly rare disease that only uh, occurs about 350 new cases per year in the U.S., and it affects about 1 million people per year worldwide. It usually occurs in people over 60, and it typically has a one-year survival rate of 30%. So everybody who gets CJD eventually dies. The early stages of this disease include rapidly progressive dementia, behavioral changes, lack of coordination, hallucinations, and um, myoclonus, which is jerky movement. There's other symptoms that are also associated with it, including anxiety, depression, paranoia, obsessive compulsive symptoms, psychosis, speech impairment, and ataxia. And eventually this progresses to pronounced mental deterioration, involuntary movements, blindness, and weakness of extremities. Wow. So that's intense. Mm -hmm. So in the U.S., which has 315 million people, more or less, mm -hmm. we get about 350, right? Yes. So a very tiny, tiny percent of that yes. throughout the population. But it's so severe and unstoppable that only 30% of people will survive for one year once you have it. Right. And would you even want to survive for one year with the symptoms that occur? Because you are not only having these physical symptoms, you're having these mental symptoms as well. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what protein exactly is that that causes CJD? Um, 
So I'm not actually sure of the type of protein, but I know that there are different types of CJD. So one type is known as sporadic CJD, which is non-inherited or spontaneous. And this is what happens when a protein in your brain just suddenly becomes misfolded for no reason whatsoever, which is kind of scary to think about. That no just reason? Like, no reason. It'll spontaneously. So it's like an aneurysm. It just boop, yeah, pops ex in. Exactly. Yes. So uh, this is very deadly and it can be fatal within weeks and it counts for about 85% of all cases. Wow. So spontaneous. Yes. CJD. Yes. Just bam. Mm -hmm. But there's no known cause for it being uh, misfolded and aggregating. It's just a reproducible mm -hmm. event that occurs on a small percentage of the population. Yes. yes. So think about like as you said, having an aneurysm, like, bam, you could just have an aneurysm. You can just suddenly sporadically accrue cancer cells to the point where your body can't fight off the amount of cancer cells that have built up, and then you get cancer. It's the same thing. It's just I mean, sudden. For aneurysms, you have certain predisposures or activities or habits that help facilitate the activity of an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. Well, occurring. who's to say that there's not also certain things that can cause the CJD to occur as well. Well, it's the people that study it, but do we have that information? Nope, not yet. Not yet, yes. so it's still being studied. It's still being studied. There's very little known about prion diseases right now. I mean, now. it's probably hard to collect all the data with yep. such a small population size. Yes, exactly. And when your subjects are dying uh, within weeks, it's a little hard to study as well. So. Yeah, I'm sure they don't want to be poked and prodded, you know, no. on their last week. Yeah, probably not, yeah. Yeah. So there's actually other types of CJD. Um, these include familial, which account for about 15%. And there's an incredibly rare acquired CJD, which accounts for less than 1% of cases. And this can result from contaminated tissue and medical procedures, such as blood transfusions or organ transplants. And no one with any type of CJD has lived past two and a half years. Wow. So mm -hmm. it's perfectly fatal. Yes. The, the perfect killing machine. Oh, yeah. And it's not even like something's attacking us. It's our own inner proteins that we, we built up from mm -hmm. a small little baby amino acid. Yep. Still in its little amino acid form. Uh -huh. And we build it up and build it up. And we finally make it into a full-grown protein. Mm -hmm. And it turns on us. It betrays us. Yes. And kills us. So mm -hmm. you have the, a tiny percentage that is familial, mm -hmm. right? And then less than 1% can be infected from contaminated tissue. Yes. Now that's scary. It is scary. If proteins had the wherewithal to try to reproduce themselves, mm -hmm. right? Right. Much like arguably DNA and RNA are. It's just mm -hmm. some type of bio macromolecule that's like, huh, I should make more of myself. Right. Which is nothing more than what life basically is at this point. But if proteins which has been argued is the precursor to DNA and RNA, which is the information storage. Because mm -hmm. proteins, much like the prions, once they're aggregated, they can potentially fold other things to their same likeness. Yes. So the best way, Brittany, mm -hmm. for the prions to take over is to start spreading through, through tissue and blood, right? Right. Especially if you can jump around, mm -hmm. enter us uh -huh. through what we eat. Yes, it absolutely can. So there was actually a very well-known case about this known as a variant, Creutzfeldt-Jacobs uh, disease. So this has the same name as Creutzfeldt-Jacobs, but it's very different because it was actually a result of ingestion of meat infected with something known as bovine spongiform encephalopathy. This is also known as mad cow disease. Are so, the cows really mad, though? Uh, yes, essentially. So, so those sporadic activities and movements, mm -hmm. right? Paranoia. It's like, whoa, man, whoa, the bar's like getting way closer, dude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so nobody knows what the cows were really thinking, but they certainly were acting mad. I just told you what they were thinking. Oh. So okay. they were mad. <laughs> you knew. You were there. <laughs> no, I can just feel it. My mammalian glands are connecting with them. Oh, okay. I, I feel, I feel <laughs> the, the cows, and I can connect with them. All right? <laughs> Please, I, I know what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> so, this... <laughs> I'm going to need you to put your clothes back on if no. you don't stop. <laughs> Brittany, don't mention my nakedness to our listeners. They can't see this. That's the whole point. This is why we have a talk show rather than a view show. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Matt... Moving on. <laughs> Move... <laughs> You 
UK, Brittany. The UK. <laughs> yes. So mad cow disease had an outbreak in the UK from 1986 to 2015. And this led to 184,000 cows to be diagnosed with BSE, or bovine spongiform encephalopathy, with 4.4 million cows eradicated during this purge. So it was believed to actually have been spread throughout cattle populations by the practice of including meat and bone meal in their feed, which contain remains of infected cattle or scrapie infected sheep. So scrapie is a prion that occurs in sheep as well. If a species eats its own species, it tends to be bad. It tends it, to be bad, yes. So you're either getting whatever disease killed that creature, or you're getting things such as these prions, which are just the proteins that killed these creatures. Mm -hmm. No matter what, it seems that if you really want to propagate some type of infectious material, disease, or protein inside of a population, just start feeding them to each other. Yeah, essentially. So, you know. That's why I'm not eating your thighs on the AT when you die. <laughs> I don't know what's in there. <laughs> that's true. You don't know what's in my thighs. And that's also why I refuse to eat that uh, protein drink, Soylent, because Soylent is people. So. But the point, Brittany, that I want to get back to, right, <laughs> is that's a lot of cows to lose out on. The poor moo-moos in the UK. I know, Right. Yeah. So if we have the cows... And we have CJD, which is mad cow disease, just a variant of CJD. Right. And CJD killed people usually in less than a year. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. What about cows? How long did they live? So for cows, they actually fared a bit better. From infection to onset of symptoms is about four to five years. And from symptom onset to death, however, is a few weeks to months. So infected cattle exhibited such symptoms as weight loss, poor coordination, tremors, aggression, frenzy, ataxia, and eventually coma and then death. So the cows were okay for a little bit from the onset of, of their symptoms and then once they became infected they acted real crazy and hence the term mad cow disease and then they eventually died so this disease right that mm -hmm. spreads through the population it sounds like the perfect maelstrom of being able to spread this disease throughout the population whilst staying undercover mm -hmm. while it's slowly spreading creating little anarchy cells right. throughout the population and then they start rising up afterwards yes so four to five years, right? Yes. So that's, that's enough to infect a lot. Yeah, that's why it was such a problem because it the cows who were infected showed no symptoms for four to five years. So people were eating the infected meat, not knowing that there was anything wrong with these particular cattle until suddenly they would start dropping dead. And then the people would become infected with the variant CJD. So once humans became infected through the ingestion of infected cow meat, which the highest risk from injection was from the brain or spinal cord, they would result in this different prion disease, which is the variant CJD. So symptoms for humans included psychiatric and behavioral problems and painful dysthetic or abnormal sensations. So the median life expectancy once it's spread to humans is about 13 months. 13 months. That's not a lot of time to be like, oh, wow, I ate this delicious steak and now it's going to kill me. Yes, essentially. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> but luckily, uh, bad cow disease isn't really a problem in the UK any further. So they purged the large amount of cows and they believe that it's now under control. That makes me think, though, what was the infection percentage of infected meat eaten to person infected, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Because yeah, you can yeah. eat this infected meat, but the prion may not necessarily infect you. So Exactly. Yeah, your highest chance of getting the disease is if you ate the brain or spinal cord, which is the highest concentration of where these prions were occurring. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. if you're just eating some other form of it... Um, example like if you're eating a steak you probably have a lower chance of getting the infection because you're eating the muscle whereas you're eating something like mcdonald's which you know not the best quality of meat so they're using just every a part. meat grinder of anything that comes through yeah exactly so there probably is bits of brain and and spinal cord in that listen safety precautions cost too much okay <laughs> we've been over this now please go back to work <laughs> yes exactly so, Brittany, we have man-cow disease infecting it because we eat it, right? Mm -hmm. But prions have been known to be a familial disease, which is very unfortunate. Yes. So there is an example of a familial prion. This is known as gerstmann straussler schlinkler syndrome, or GSS for short, because dear God, that's hard to say. Is, is that guy the guy that made the Schlinkler line? <laughs> the Schlinkler line. <laughs> yes, 
It's the same guy. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> no, I'm fucking with you. Um, so this is a rare familial Perian disease with a duration ranging from three months to 13 years and an average duration of five or six years. And it includes some early symptoms such as dysarthia or difficulty speaking, cerebellar truncal ataxia or unsteadiness, and progressive dementia. And then some other symptoms include the spasmodic muscle contractions again, involuntary movement in the eyes, visual disturbances, and blindness or deafness. So it appears that this is mostly a central nervous system problem where you start developing these misfolded proteins, right? Yes. So if I have misfolded proteins in my calf, right, mm -hmm. then maybe I'll just have mad baby cow disease. <laughs> 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 but otherwise, if I have full-grown uh, <laughs> yeah. mad cow disease, uh -huh. it, it's typically in the central nervous system, right? Yes, correct. The, the point that I wanted to make for this, this pivot, uh -huh. right, was all these last names, they sound oddly, I don't know, Germanic? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have a certain subset of the population that has developed prions in that area, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm just thinking, how can we make this into a zombie disease? Oh, right? a zombie disease. I'm just saying, it mm -hmm. makes you irritated. Mm -hmm. It makes you have difficulty speaking. Mm -hmm. It makes you have involuntary movements, mm -hmm. right? Aggression. Right. Madness. Uh -huh. That sounds to me like mm -hmm. quite the culmination. Yeah. Of things. Well, you are, are in luck because there is a prion disease known as Kuru. So, Kuru was a. Uh, Kuru was formerly common among the Foray people in Papua New Guinea. And the Foray people, what they did was ritualistically cooked and consumed body parts of their family members following their death. And this was to symbolize respect and mourning. And because the brain is the organ enriched with the infectious agent prion, women and children who consumed the brain and viscera had a much likely, higher likelihood of being infected by men who prefer preferentially consume the muscles. So you have these people eating, a, you know, doing the ritual cannibalism. People eating people. Yes. And they would, in turn, get infected by this prion disease known as Kuru. Okay, so it started spreading. How does that have to do with the zombie virus? You didn't at, at all relate what I past said to what you said. I've, I really don't appreciate the pivots that you make to my pivots because uh, they don't correspond and line up. How are our listeners going to develop a nice congruent story, Brittany. <laughs> okay, fine. So there are different stages, and these sound kind of like zombie stages. Is that better? Okay, so the first stage is the ambulance stage. Does that sound like something you'd hear in a zombie movie? Oh, yeah, the zombies are going through the ambulance stage right now. Pretty soon, they'll go through the sedentary stage and then the terminal stage, which is too late. Is that what you want to hear, Joel? Fine. That's all I was asking for. <laughs> Anyway, Kuru has three stages. The first of which is the amulet stage or the zombie stage, sure. And so this stage is characterized by unsteady stance and gait, decreased muscle control, tremors, and difficulty pronouncing words. And this will actually start progressing to uh, the sedentary stage, which is walking capabilities, ataxia, severe tremors, emotional instability, depression, and strangely enough, sporadic laughter. Sporadic laughter. Yes. Wow, that sounds scary. Yeah. To mm -hmm. hear your family member just sporadically laughing. While manically. they're having these severe tremors and, and yeah. gait problems. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it actually used to be known as like a smiling disease because you know people were ambling around and then they would just be sporadically laughing for no reason. And it was a, a little disturbing. And then once they got to this stage, it would progress to the terminal stage, which it was severe ataxia, dysphagia, or difficulty swallowing, and that led to malnutrition. In addition, they would have incontinence, unresponsiveness, inability to speak, and chronic ulcerated wounds. So ulcerated wounds. There you go. There's another something connected to zombies. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. I'm glad I could help. I'm glad you could. <laughs> still that's a scarily dark thing to think about right yeah it really is but luckily once people figured out what was going on over there and it wasn't just sorcery as the forey people thought scientists would tell the people hey this is how this is spreading the forey people stopped doing the ritualistic cannibalism and therefore kuru stopped that's at least Delightful to know that they were able to forego uh, traditions mm -hmm. in order to mitigate some of the problems that we're able to see thanks to technology right. and medical advances. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, Brittany, it's often 
known and hypothesized that were you to have such a central nervous system disease that would infect you and create something similar to a zombie apocalypse, that zombies don't need to sleep, right? Right. That's true because they can just get, walk around. They have no need for rest. They can just keep going forever. That's why even in zombie movies where the zombies are slow, they're still a threat because you need to rest eventually, but the zombies don't. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I recall my prion days of studying in biology, mm -hmm. I've actually read about fatal familial insomnia. Yes. And we've actually talked about this before on this podcast. We talked about this in episode two. Uh, fatal familial insomnia, a type of insomnia. But we'll recap real quick for those who have not listened to this episode. Oh, yeah, we, we will recap. Recap? <laughs> Re recap. Recap real quick. <laughs> anyway. So, anyways, Brittany. So back in episode two, Brittany, yeah. we were discussing the incredibly rare FFI, or mm -hmm. fatal familial insomnia, right? Yes. Which is that prion disease, which unfortunately has a very low life expectancy i think we said seven months to six years mm -hmm. it's incredibly rare too because there's only 24 cases diagnosed uh ever and it has there's a gene for ffi only found in 40 families globally so there's a particular gene so they've been able to link this incredibly 24 case problem mm -hmm. to a gene yes but they can't actually relate the PRP? Yes. That's incredibly interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And I think maybe because fatal familial insomnia is such a alarming disease that, that had symptoms that w warranted investigation. All of them have symptoms warranting investigation. Every last <laughs> prion disease warrants investigation because of how severe and deadly and unstoppable it is. That is true. But I think because uh, with FFI, it's had such symptoms as the insomnia that pretty much never let you sleep. You never slept once you progressed far enough into FFI. I think that's what caused the intense research into it. I, I, it's very obvious if it occurs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we were to recap, there are four stages uh -huh. for FFI. Right. So the first stage is worsening insomnia coupled with panic attacks, anxiety, and paranoia, and phobias as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's about zero to four months. Yes. Past four months to nine months, it just gets worse. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and worse. Then, and yeah. more hallucinations. Right. And then following that, 9 to 12 months, you have a complete inability to sleep and rapid weight loss. So you can't sleep at all. And I think this is probably what warranted all the investigation into it. Right. And then finally, 12 to 8 months, you have the dementia and then the unresponsive and muteness. So very rapidly, the body starts degradating and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. Nothing at all. And people have even tried treating it with barbiturates and it's was actually found to worsen the disease by speeding up the symptoms so there's nothing you can do really mm -hmm. wow yeah <laughs> again so every period disease known to man is completely incurable unstoppable. yes i'm pretty sure Brittany, when you were discussing what was happening in your mother's village they basically have perhaps the beginning of a prion zombie development. That is entirely possible. Yeah, my mom's town right now is going through a zombie apocalypse. So there are deer that are just uh, going crazy there and they're kind of rotting. Uh, in addition, there she posted some videos of like a possum going crazy as well. Uh, there's the wildlife are going insane up there. So she's about to go through a zombie apocalypse. It but, sounds about right. Yeah. So not only can humans get prions, but we talked about the cows. Mm -hmm. We talked about the, what did you say, scurvy, scabies? Scrapey. Scrapies. <laughs> Scrapey. Scrapey. I'm Among just going to, I'm just going to pretend that all the sheep have scurvy. In scurvy. Our, <laughs> pirate, pirate sheep. sheep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And in addition, uh, deer can get something known as chronic wasting disease or CWD, which these all have symptoms similar to BSC. So that is probably what the deer that are in my mom's town have um, entirely possible. So it could easily have a crossover mm -hmm. of these prions right. if people were to eat the deer. Yes. And I would imagine in such a village, people would 
eat the deer yeah. without concern for the open scabs and wounds yes. on the body. Yes. Now that I think about it, I'm probably not going to have any venison from that area for a long time. Yeah, it's probably the best choice. Yeah. Uh-huh. And what's even scarier is that prions are now believed to play a part in other diseases, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, or immunotrophic lateral sclerosis. So what was originally thought to be a different mechanism for these diseases are now believed to be linked to a type of sporadic prion disease. So biochemistry is a rapidly developing field. It's actually one of the largest fields that are capable of progressing in terms of the amount of information that they are gathering due to big data and increased capabilities of applying new technologies and instrument analysis to understanding molecules inside the body, right? Mm -hmm. So because they're so complex, uh, you have these three-dimensional functionalities as well as the individual little building blocks, right? Mm -hmm. So you have amino acids. Just taking proteins, for example, even though there are a plethora of other macromolecules within bodies that need to be studied, mm -hmm. you have tiny little amino acids being built up, right? right? And then that will be the primary structure. Then you have a secondary structure about how those go together. So is it alanine, phenylalanine? Arginine, lysine. Yeah. Arginine, lysine, right? So the secondary structures, which is how those amino acids are put together. Then you have the tertiary structure or how they will fold and contort themselves. And then the quaternary structure, which is those large aggregates along with other aggregates of these protein linkages, right? Mm -hmm. So now you have multiple proteins all together creating essentially a larger macromolecule of a material. And those are incredibly complex, right? So mm -hmm. we just talked about four stages of how proteins can vary. And just by changing one or two of those individual building blocks, you will drastically change that secondary tertiary and quaternary structures, mm -hmm. which completely change the functionality. So typically, structure, morphology is related to functionality. So just by altering those slightly, you will have things such as these spirons, which are admissible to proteins, and they're able to aggregate continuously, right? Mm -hmm. So the information that we can gather from here is absolutely fascinating, and I am excited to see what develops further as biochemistry and microbiology continue to grow due to the now available big data analysis as well as some of the new instrumentation that's been developing in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. I'm hoping that because technology is progressing so much for biochemistry that we're now able to start looking into some cures for prion diseases, um, maybe even preventative treatments for it. Now, to argue with you, which I never like to do because mm -hmm. I always lose, <laughs> prion disease is extremely rare, right? Right. Now, if we were thinking purely in a utilitarian aspect, it would make no sense to put money and effort towards the thing that kills so few people, whereas we could take that research money, put it towards much larger problems. That is true. Um, there are some diseases that you know don't really have a lot of funding, though and get very little funding. So, for example, when people were doing the Ice Bucket Challenge back a few years ago, that was to raise awareness for ALS because a lot of people didn't know what it was. So, yeah, there's going to always be research for these large diseases that kill more people, but I think that it's still valuable to look into doing research for these smaller, more concentrated projects as well. I agree, Brittany. Mm -hmm. I, what I actually think, not just arguing that we should have utilitarianism inside of medical research, but that a lot of people underestimate the value of tangential research and that once we develop more knowledge in this field, it actually helps build a few blocks that another field can step on and be like, oh, wow, look at the information that they've gathered here. We can now apply this as well. So it's building the well of knowledge capable for picking and plucking so that we can advance other fields. Yes, exactly. So fundamental research, although I find it extraordinarily boring, I understand the value that it has for developing it further on, right? Right. I also find it incredibly boring, but what can you do? Somebody needs to do it. Somebody needs to do it, uh -huh. not, not us. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> so beyond that, it sounds like there's no cure, nor mm -hmm. will there ever be a cure, but we can continue to study it and perhaps try to understand some more of the biochemical mechanisms that are behind not only prions, but other protein the protein folding right exactly. so lately we've developed CRISPR or 
in layman's terms, gene editing. What happens when we can go in and create individual macromolecule proteins, Mm -hmm. which currently right now is rather difficult. In fact, there are some colleagues that are trying to work on these macromolecules. The only problem is that because they have 20 different types of monomers, that it's extraordinarily difficult for us to synthesize that. Right. Whereas you have hundreds to thousands of amino acids aligned together to create these structures. Mm -hmm. We're having a difficult time just reaching 100. Yeah. So what happens is by studying these prions, understanding the mechanisms of folding, what we can do with that, right? What if we can just inject protein straight into someone's particular area and those are able to fold in a particular area and take clumps of something Mm -hmm. and move it away? Yeah, that would be very interesting. Either way, Brittany, I think that the information that is currently being gathered in the biochemistry field and bioinformation, biotechnology, and medical research, utterly fascinating. I look forward to discussing that more. However, I think that concludes today's episode. I think it does conclude today's episode. And in addition to conclude our episode, I gotta do the things. So you can contact us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Gmail under PRTCast. You should contact us. Do it. It makes us feel loved and important. Yay! I love when people contact us and give us information, thoughts, ideas, Mm -hmm. even dissenters. Yeah. Like, oh, look at them. Look at them go. I want more dissenters. We only had the one so far. Only the one. Only the one. So, if you have questions, comments, and or concerns, Mm -hmm. feel free to contact us. Of course, if you would like to see more content developing, which, mind you, the store is being built. Is it? Yes, it is being built. Oh, okay. So, we will have items available for people really that what donate kinds to of us. items will we have that is a mystery <laughs> you don't know yet is what you're saying uh, it's a mystery for me <laughs> is what i meant <laughs> that's fair so we of course have the patreon for people to donate if they'd wish uh-huh. and as always we'll put up the references uh-huh and i think it's been great and we'll be back next week Brittany, do you know what we're talking about next week you know i have no idea but i think we're talking about ants you said in another episode that we're going to talk about ants and then we didn't but i think this time we're talking about ants right yeah. ants yes yeah. we'll probably talk about ants it's been a crazy semester it really has it's been very busy <laughs> i appreciate the patience of our listeners i do too so if you're lucky we'll talk about ants if you're not lucky we'll talk about something else and you should still feel lucky <laughs> yeah you so. totally should to listen to our dulcimer tones dulcet tones i i saw the dulcimers on the way up and i thought uh, yeah i am a country bumpkin so what and you're florida man <laughs> <laughs> collapse into four d10 alligators upon your death <laughs> all right you keep talking there's gonna be a real florida man <laughs> Ooh, is that a threat? It's a promise. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week. We'll see you next week. Why do you say see? We never see them. Well, sometimes we see them. When we yeah. see Katie, we see them. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, we see one of, of them. Yeah. I saw Rose. That was one. Yeah, sometimes we see fans. Anyways, we will see you. And if we don't see you, I guess you'll be on the other side of this dial di- trilogue trilogue where you trilogue. Get, don't talk to us yeah this round, you can talk to us this round table of squareness uh yes linear linearity yeah I, yeah just me across from you and you across from me and then people listening on the other side all right guys yeah. thanks for listening <laughs> we'll be back next week we'll, we'll be back next week